All right, folks, good evening, good morning, hello, wherever you might be. Welcome to another episode of V Brown Bag. This evening, we have got a, we're, we're taking a turn. We are going over to talk about Azure. We haven't talked about Azure in quite some time now. And we wanted to see what was happening over in one of the other public clouds. I know that we've had a lot of AWS heroes on recently. So I wanted to balance the scales if, if not by a lot, then by a little bit and, and bring in some, some high powered brains in the form of Nathan Farrar. Right. Uh, hey, Nathan, how's it going? Fantastic. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Nathan and I work together over at WWT and we actually go back. So this, this is going to be a unorthodox episode of the brown bag. <laughs> <laughs> gotta keep the inside jokes inside <laughs> well yeah yeah exactly not 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 wildly unorthodox all right so this evening we are talking about routing in azure and how we can make it better yeah yeah and originally it was can we make it better can we it was there was a question and i and i wanted to be i wanted to be a hard-hitting resounding yes so we are going to make it better this evening aren't we nathan this evening specifically no we're not no, but oh, we, this oh no. evening we can we can talk about ways to. Oh well, that's that's fantastic. All right. So before we get started, here's a couple of show notes. All right. If you want to get in on the conversation, and you are on Twitter, I will be paying attention to the tweetosphere. Nathan will not. He'll be working on a presentation. I will be paying attention to the social medias. And if you at the brown bag or hashtag the brown bag, I will be paying attention. You can feel free to throw a question in there, or if you are in the live studio audience. I will be paying attention to both the chat channel and the Q&A channel. So if you have a question, feel free to throw your hand up, ask a question in the Q&A. I will pose it to Mr. Farrar. If you want to follow Nathan on Twitter, uh, you can follow him at nfarrar, F-A-R-R-O-A-R. Um, he's not on there a lot. He doesn't spend a whole lot of time on Twitter, unfortunately. So he's not dispensing snippets of wisdom to the masses. Uh, he, he sends me snippets of wisdom all the time via DMs and chats and everything like that, but, but not to everybody, which is a travesty, Nathan. Uh, hey, that might change if I become famous all of a sudden. I don't know if, not, what not I from think. The, not from this, but you, I mean, uh, I hope you do. I, 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 get a, I get a website now. I get a blog. So that might be a thing. Do you really? I, what is it? It's uh, uh, furore.com. We will talk about that. Is it, is it in your slide deck? Is it, are you going to talk about it? Yeah, it's at the end. Yeah, it's in. Yep. All right, excellent. So um, I also highly discourage you from following me. I'm Chris Williams. I'm at Mistwire on Twitter. And oh, Sean Doyle said he was going to be on to, to help co-host, and he failed miserably. So what? do not follow Cloud Osmotic on Twitter. That's not Okay, fair. with that, <laughs> Nathan, I am going to stop sharing. And you are going to start sharing. All righty. So let's see here. I did a PowerPoint. Don't screw it up. Don't screw it up. Oh, I oh you screwed, screwed it up. up. The oh, wrong one. How embarrassing for you. I, I hope no one minds. I use the coffee stain theme for my, <laughs> I couldn't figure out anything. I like simplicity. I like smooth surfaces. Whatever. It's fine. I, I like guess my, I'll be okay. Like my brain. Um, no, no wrinkles no wrinkles <laughs> um i'm not gonna talk about that I was, that was gonna go somewhere i was gonna on go the brain somewhere. on the brain wrinkles I'm on gonna, the brain i'm not gonna let it not not gonna all right so um so what am i doing what am i doing should i should i talk about what i am other yes than In, okay introduce yourself say hello to the folks the kind right. gentle folks at home Okay, folks. So who I am is Nathan. And what I do is a senior cloud architect, specifically in the Azure worlds at WWT, Worldwide Technologies. Um, thanks, Chris, getting me um, visibility over here. It's fantastic. <laughs> I love it. Um, but my background uh, is a little storied. I started out in automation and uh, I started doing things for expensive houses. And then I got into networking and I did my stint in the uh, in the knock and and help desk and I went through all of my punches and I eventually got into networking and did some Cisco lettering at the end of my name 
And, and I really enjoyed that. And then I started discovering things like NSX and, and Python and automation and then cloud. And, and then so I eventually just deep dove into cloud and, um, and some VMware stuff as well. You kind of can't go into cloud without touching VMware. Mm-hmm. Um, but from there, recently, my biggest thing has been automation. And, and I can't do anything. And one of the best things about coming from a networking background is that it's really, it really sticks with me. And I oftentimes see where people will get into cloud in this whole new world, world we are weird world for an organization. They're, oh, we want to get into AWS, Azure, GCP. Um, but they just bypass infrastructure. They just think it's, oh, you just go in there and you click it and you make it do its things and development happens. Um, you know, but then they bump up against all the sharp edges when things don't work correctly, or they start making a Swiss cheese environment because they forget this is still the internet. This has still got IP addresses. There's still a lot that you need to do. So, um, one of the things I first learned to, when I talk to and consult clients is that you're building a data center. This is a data center. This is not, yes, it's cloud. And yes, you see it through a nice, pretty portal, but it is a really, it's really a data center and it really has the same type of issues. Um, it's just easier to do some other things and harder to do some other things. So anyway, that's kind of me where I'm at, um, like long walks on the beach and building things or taking things apart. Oh, um, and boat and- rides. And, and boat rides, I love boat rides. So anyway, mm-hmm. so I'll start it off here. So this is my little Hey Azure. So here's the Hey Azure, w- what do we want? So what is it that I, uh, why am I doing this? What, why did I wanna talk about routing and all that kind of stuff? It's because I started getting really annoyed at um, wanting to see what I usually saw in my data world, my data center and in, in the networking world. When I log into a, a CLI uh, you know, for a router or something, which you can still do in some aspects if you deploy a router. I want to be able to do a show route. I want to be able to see where data is going. I want to be. I want to have network visibility. the The pretty graphics are fantastic, and that's really nice. And 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 the people that pay for uh, the cloud love to see that too because it's easy to document sometimes. Um, but <laughs> what you're what you're missing is opportunities to improve because you're not getting full visibility. I'm going to get more into that too. I also want more control. I want to be able to have my default routes go where I want them to go. I don't want Azure, while it is nice and because Azure has to, and AWS is the same way, they have to give you some kind of automagical stuff um, because they don't want you to have to be me. They don't want you to have to have a networking background in order to go use it. You know, they want you to consume the services and the networking part is a very small portion of the services that are provided. Um, so, and I also want less interaction. I don't want the development team to have to request X and Y in order for them to do stuff. I want automation and, you know, automation has been around in the networking infrastructure world forever. Uh, BGP, you know, has been there. It's going to always be there and it is in Azure. It's just not real, at least not real to us. We see like a very lightweight version of it. Um, and I also want to make the people happy. Like I, security teams get really ornery when they have bad environments and they're, you know, things aren't thought out. And, you know, you want to prevent the necessity for hindsight. You don't want to look back and be like, oh, I really wish we spent some time thinking about this before we got it audited um, and, and before we got, you know, ransomware or something because of something silly. And we also want the people that make the money, make the money. You know, the dev teams need to do dev things. They need to build stuff that drive the company. And that's what really matters at the end of the day. Um, but they can't do what they can, they should be doing unless they have something to build on that's stable. I mean, it's just, it's infrastructure. That's how it is with everything, building whatever. Uh, and flexibility. Obviously, you want to be able to scale. You want to be able to not code yourself or build yourself into a corner. Uh, that concept of flexibility runs across the gamut of whatever you're doing in IT. Um, without that, you know, you're it could be job security <laughs> if you don't have flexibility, but at the same time, it's just not good for what we do. Um, and I'll just keep on going, Chris. If, if you want me to stop for anything, you just let me know. But I'll just keep on going. I Oop. absolutely will. We we don't have any we don't have any questions yet. Um, but once when, when one pops, I will uh, wait for you to pause for a breath and interject myself. Okay, so I'm going to take the humble hub and spoke topology. This is kind of the standard. And if it's if you don't oh, know if it's the so standard. Humble. 
it is the standard. It's kind of the best practice. If you decide to read the cloud adoption framework, they're going to talk about hub and spoke because, you know, router on a stick is something that's still around and it's, it worked quite well. Um, you're not going to be able to do like cloth fabrics and all the fancy stuff you do with, with data centers that you run, um, but you don't want to. That's what they're doing behind the scenes. They're taking that off your back. They're all doing overlays. So when I'm talking about all the stuff I'm talking about, it's based upon this kind of a concept. So it's humble. It's simple. Uh, it's hub and spoke. So we're building hub and spoke. We're not doing anything too complicated outside of that. That's pretty much all you ever need to do, honestly. I mean, there are some specifics, but generally this covers most bases. So things we want to do, things we do rather, but we shouldn't have to do. Now, these are my kind of my, the things that bug me, having to hard code routes anywhere, because that always causes a problem because then someone's going to need to change it. So a default route and a user defined routing table, you, once you hard code something, that is now a fixed entity, it's not a variable, and you can't even put a note on there and says, I put this route in here to do this for this reason. Well, it might be obvious to the person doing it at the time, a year and a half, two years down the time. I mean, just like we want to comment code, I would love to comment things like that. With a firewall, with a router, you can put things next to those. You can identify, you get metadata around it. Uh, you don't have that. So we have to deal with putting in you know, hard-coded routes. Um, we also deal with a lot of limited visibility in the routing world. We can't pull up the same, we can't see status really when it comes to appearing a, a relationship. We can see that it's up or down. We can't see what part of it's broken. So then we are forced to go and beg uh, the folks, get, try to get the right person at, at Microsoft to, 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 to look at it and say, oh, this is because of this. But oftentimes they'll first ask you, do you have a network virtual appliance? Oh, I have a Palo Alto. Okay, you want to check that for a couple of weeks first and then get back to us. So it's it's kind of that always pushing it off. I mean, Microsoft support's actually really good usually, but typically you have to pay a little extra for it. Um, so there's that. We also work down the same, the same concept here, working with watered down stuff. Um, it's not that the background is watered down. It's still BGP. They just only... The pane of glass only gives you what they think you need and also things that you can't break easily. You can't break their stuff. Now, the good news is they're starting to do better. They're starting to open things up. And a lot of the things you can't see in the portal, you can you can ping via the API. You can pull stuff through uh, REST calls. You know, you can get your trusty postman out and start doing stuff. So you can do a little bit more, but it just requires that extra time. If something's down, you want to figure it out or you want to alert on something if a BGP status changes, you want to have more flexibility there and want to be able to see everything personally. And this is my one of my biggest pet peeves is the, the Swiss cheese environments. Uh, IP addresses like sprinkles everywhere. Um, a lot of the standard build processes for VMs and Azure is automatically say, hey, you want a public IP on this? And people go next, 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 next. Um, I mean, not, not, not the good people, but a lot of people do. And what happens is, a month later, they find out they have RDP open to the world in six different places and, you know, they didn't back up and all these different things happen and it's completely preventable, but it's, you know, it's um, not having control, not having visibility and, and not having processes in place around routing forces people to open up public IP addresses because they don't know how to get to it or they can't get to it. There's no easy way. They have to call 16 different people. Um, just to get a route added somewhere else because it's manual in some aspects. And then developers, uh, not screwing things up, of course, forgetting things. We heart developers. We want them to do what they do, but they, they aren't network people. They're not infrastructure people and they don't get paid to be. Um, but when they need to get a job done, they expect it to react the same way it does when they say, click on a new Kubernetes cluster. Oh, it spins up, it works. Um, it's not how it works with infrastructure. There's more planning involved um, and that's a good thing, but it's not planned out well enough, in my opinion, sometimes. Okay, so visibility, what I'm talking about here is just, it's not packet captures. You can do that. They're not very useful in Azure, but you can do it. Um, we just need to see things, changes in topology. We want to know when things are going, moving around and bumping in the night. We don't want to not see a flapping route because that could be costly and it could cause problems that would appear to be an, an issue with an application, but it's actually not, it's a routing problem. Um, 
Uh, we need to do too many different things. So like I said, putting in routing tables and making sure that routing table is updated and then going into the firewall and making sure that has a new network pointing to wherever the other new VNet you de deployed is. You know, all these different kind of processes can be automated in 19 different ways, but you shouldn't have to home grow your own Python script or PowerShell script to make that work. It should be built in. It can be built in. It's all there. Mm -hmm. um, BGP is designed to do that. That's why it exists and why it has worked for since the beginning of network time. Um, so, and we want networks to be aware of each other when they come and go. So, like I said, if, if somebody needs to in their development world spit up something, and it needs access to on-prem resources, you don't have to have call the security guy, the network guy, just that way they can add a route and add a rule. You know, you should have some automation there. You should be able to learn that that happened and, you know, have some guardrails and policies around stuff. But just like you do with the data center, things get added and the rest of the network learns. And if it goes away, the rest of the network learns. Um, so that's what I'm talking about with visibility. And things, things we want is tighter control. Like I said, I keep on hitting that, you know, being able to see the control plane, which is BGP, um, you know, network virtual appliances, your Palos, your Cisco's, your, your Fortinet's, your whatever's, they often, they work, they help, but again, it's, it's manual entry, it's all or nothing sometimes, and it's confusing because you have these fake IP addresses in Azure, which you get used to, you know, the dot one address that doesn't exist, but does exist. Um, you know, me again, coming from a networking perspective, those things are like, okay, how do I, and a lot of clients come to me like this and say, how do I equate this to normal networking? And I, I say, don't, you can't, they kind of exist, but you have to look at it as a new data center. It's a new concept and, and, and things are just different. Um, and you have to level up on that. Um, default routing is something that's super key. You know, that's something that everything falls back on, but you know, how can we address that better? And I will talk about that. Um, and then equal cost multipathing, backup routes, better route metrics, IP SLA, some other things that we're so used to having in the internets and that are, you know, IP SLA is a precursor essentially to all type of SD-WAN. And it is a very simple thing to be able to say, okay, is this path good? Is it get this kind of jitter? Okay, I'm going to go this way instead. It's not a super complicated thing and you can do it with third-party appliances, but why not have it built in? You know, why not have more out of Azure? And I think they're starting to hear us. So there's some positive, I'm not just bitching this entire time. I am a little bit, but um, I want to know. I am a little bit, but <laughs> I, I have, I, we can do it better guys. So uh, basic routing we want. Yeah, so this is what we want to be able to do, right? This is simple. So hub and spoke, we have a subnet in one VNet and a subnet in another VNet. And we want that to be arbitrated through a firewall. We don't want to go a straight line in between these guys because, and we don't want to have net, you know, security rules everywhere. And we don't want to actually have to put this default route to the Palo Alto for every single, every single subnet. I mean, it gets heavy because when something gets added, um, it gets just, you have a lot more to do. So this is the inter VNet traffic. So this is going to have to happen. And you want your Palo Alto to be the one that decides, can it go? Can it not go? Uh, but you want the routes to be there. You want it to know about it, but then the decision to let it go. Um, this goes back to one of my pet peeves. Routing is not security. Routing is not security. Because that Palo Alto knows how to get there, it doesn't mean it's going to get there. Security is security. Visibility is important because you want to know if they're knocking on your door. You want to see a bunch of drop packets. That way you can identify if somebody's trying to do something bad. If you just say, I don't know that route, that makes me secure. That doesn't do you anything. You want visibility. It's like, I'm going to make a really bad analogy with roads and highways or something, but I'm just going to bypass it. So, and here's uh, another concept that a lot of people don't do is in, in, Travinet, so subnets that live right next to each other. How do you make them go through the firewall? Like that's something that people automatically assume if it's in the same VNet, it must be able to talk to each other. No, you should just like you with your VLAN days, you should be able to have VLAN A and VLAN B not talk to each other if you don't want them to. You, you need that flexibility. You want to be able to have it. Um, so that way you can have dev prod separated in the same VNet. I don't recommend it, but you can do it. You should be able to do it and you can do it. 
And then here's the last one is on-prem private circuits, all this kind of stuff. So if you have express routes, direct connects, you name it, whatever you want to call it, um, you want that to either be considered private traffic or public traffic. Um, and so you want to be able to control routes over that. Now, this one's a little bit more picky um, because it is BGP and they have this really thick line between um, um, express routes and how it does its thing and they don't let you see any of it really. So that's another gripe there. But okay, so now I'm gonna get into what the tools that we do have. So what does Azure do? What, what, what would I recommend to start using in Azure to make your life a little bit more, um, um, I don't know, less stressful when it comes to routing? And the first thing I have, which is actually a, uh, uh, something that comes from uh, Azure Virtual WAN that they've released quasi recently into general called uh, Azure Route Server. Now what Azure Route Server is, is a BGP thing. I don't even want to call it a server, but it's a scale set of VMs. So it's, it's a scale set um, that allows you to peer with it and trade um, BGP information. So if I want my firewalls to know about my Azure networking, it can peer, it'll learn, which is awesome, which you couldn't do before. Because you had to say, hey, Palo Alto, if you want to get to IP address 192 something, 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 your next top is going to be the dot one address, which would then figure out with auto magical routing to go through the VNet peering and it would get there and it would get back. And that's what would happen. But you'd still have to every single time a new network, a new anything gets built up in Azure, you have to go back and manually add that to that network, I mean, to that firewall. And that is just an extra step that's completely unnecessary when we have tools like BGP. So they have this route server and it gets spun up in its own special little route server subnet and it has its own special ASN, which is the same ASN that Azure's always used. Um, and it has you know, two IP addresses, so you peer with both. So you have some redundancy there. And the other thing that this does, which is really cool, is it then advertises, if you have two firewalls, both firewall paths. So you get built-in multi-cost pathing, uh, equal cost multi-pathing. So if one dies, you don't even need a load balancer. If they're active, active, by the way, if they're active, active. Um, if they're not active, active, you have to have some kind of a uh, orchestration to make things work. But let's just say they're active, active, um, which is what I typically recommend for all firewalls in Azure. So, you can have now, if you went to your device, your, your, your computer and you know, your VM in one of these VNets and you looked at it, you would see it's a little route table. It has two ways to get the internet, which you don't get any other way. With a, lo with a load balancer, you don't. You get extra cost of the load balancer. Um, you get extra configuration steps. You have to, to add things to it if you change things. This covers all of that. You don't need a load balancer unless you have something that's using the quad zero route to get out to the internet. Um, so this is really great, and it's an instant failover because it's already there. It doesn't have to do anything. It just recurses down to the next route. Um, a couple of different caveats to it. Oh, the first thing I want to say here is it does allow branch-to-branch -branch exchange. So it's basically doing what Azure Virtual WAN is doing. Actually, Virtual WAN uses this thing, but they broke it off and said you can kind of use this on your own. Um, it does allow you to peer directly with your express routes and, and bring in all that data. Um, and it does give you, if you go through the 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 API, you can see all the routing, you can see the relationships forming, you can see all that fun stuff that you really wanna see um, when it comes to, uh, to routing. So, but the big one here for, for me is not having to worry about a load balancer and not having to go back. And like I said, if anything's peered, any VNets are peered with where this guy lives, and I'll show you a full design of this thing in a minute, um, it will learn all the routes. The only thing it can't do is control routes in between subnets in the same network, which is, that's that's where they're not at yet. So hopefully they'll get there. Um, but you know you can do things like AS prepending, all the BGP things that we do. Um, yeah, here's some of the oddities. So one of them is that, which is really weird. It's not, it's a control plane thing. So it's not supposed to be in the data path. So you, you're not supposed to, I mean, they literally say it, the data does not go through the route server. But however, inside the route table of your firewall, it will say my next hop is these IP addresses. 
So it's lying to you or someone's lying to somebody. Um, I, you know, trace route, trace route does not really work in Azure that well, so it, it won't actually show up, but that's one of those weird things when you deploy these things, it, it, they're not quite there to make it user friendly, uh, but it works fantastically. It doesn't actually go through it. Um, it needs a public IP address, which is interesting. So this is one of those things where Azure automagical things, they say it's private, it's a private cloud. It's a, well, it's a public cloud, but public IPs are used for Azure to talk to Azure. And so this is one of those instances where it needs a, pu a, pu a public IP. And sometimes in auditing, that gets to be a question, but you can't do it. You know, you, you have to have a public IP. It's not accessible by the internet. You can't peer with it. Um, you can't even put a, a network security group on it. It's just there, but just one of those kind of oddities. And um, let's see here, what do I have here? Yeah, you can't force a subnet to subnet traffic to go through the NBA. Uh, using the Azure Route service. That would be nice. So that's a, a request I actually put out there in the GitHub community and they never responded, <laughs> probably because they can't do it, um, but that would be nice. So in that case, if you really needed to do what I had back here, uh, this one, you would still have to do routes on each separate thing. So say levy. The other, so this is what it would look like. Here's, a, here's an example of what I call a, a pretty awesome use case for automated routing, having the capabilities of, you know, using a load balancer in the case of it, maybe you have a DMZ, you don't want to share routes with, you want one-way peering, all that kind of stuff. You can still throw a load balancer in there with two VMs that are doing active-active. Um, you have Bastion living in here instead of out in the world because Bastion does work best if you keep it in the hub. You don't need to have six different Bastion hosts. One can do for the most part. And then you have the route server. So then there it goes. Here's its little IP address. And then once that guy's there, uh, it will and, and you peer with it, you can start doing some really interesting creative stuff. Um, and you can start getting routes that you know get advertised all the way back through VPNs. You can start doing um, you know, whatever your, your, your network virtual appliances can do with routes, it can do as well. So if you didn't have an express route, you can start getting end-to-end -end BGP visibility through, you know, a GRE tunnel or, or whatever. But um, it's, it's pretty useful. I like it a lot. I love it a lot. So the other thing that we have, which is not new, but it's virtual WAN, and I don't know, a lot of people, I think I'm seeing this starting to get some, uh, some more traction. Um, it's basically a uh, transit router. It's AWS Transit Gateway. This is basically a really big version of it. Um, and what it does allow, it, 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 it sometimes builds itself as a replacement for MPLS in some ways, because you can do site-to-site -site connectivity through Azure's backbone, which is fancy nice. Um, it does require this, this, this hub and spoke, but it's like a hub in a hub and spoke. Uh, so you have this virtual WAN hub, virtual hub, and then all your networks will connect to it. And I've seen environments where this will be a hub and spoke, this will be a hub and spoke. So you kind of have this, you know, um, kind of a tree looking thing, um, that you can do just depending on how big your environment is, but you can mix, you can mix connection media. So you can have a VM in here, you can have network virtual appliances that are doing SD-WAN type stuff. You can have Express Route in there, you have a point to site, you can have a VPN native. So it's really, it's really, really cool. I like it a lot, um, but it's big. It's not, it's meant to scale. It's not meant for you have three VNets in one site. It's meant that, you know, you're going to be going all over the place. You're going to be having a very large environment and it gets expensive, you know, death of a thousand cuts in Azure and in cloud in general. Um, the ingress and egress costs for every single one of these connections adds up. This is a per hour device aside from the, the data device, uh, the data expense, and then also the um, uh, virtual appliance. You're going to want a firewall there. Azure virtual Azure firewall is like a dollar and a quarter an hour just to exist. So that, those things add up. So that's the thing to think about. You can design this same kind of thing with this same kind of concept. You don't have to go full Nelson into it. Um, but here's some, some of the pros, you know, like I said, super scalable, multi-hub, multi-spoke, and it has high availability built in. So when it comes down to being able to route between branch A and branch B, 
you know, if something goes down in the region that's closest to it, you should be able to get through the backbone. Now, there are some caveats to that because it does get weird. Um, if a region goes down, you have to then also be smart and know that your VPN at this branch needs to have two connections. So you can see how high availability, you need two virtual WAN hubs, so dual hub, and then you're paying for the twice that. Uh, so it gets expensive, it's a cost exercise. So the cons are, it's just not, you can't switch over to this concept very easily. You have to really plan it out. Could be overkill um, and pricey. And one of the reasons why I've seen this get super duper pricey is backups. Someone has a backup going to their headquarters from all of their branches and they're hitting terabytes a month, terabytes a week. Um, that, that cost, that data cost, especially then you get charged through your express route aside from getting charged through your VPNs and your VNets and all that kind of stuff, it, it will get through the roof really, really, really fast. So this is one of those things where you definitely want to practice and learn, but also think about, you know, where your data is coming from and think about that Azure likes to, to grab you by the short and curlies there. So, and the one thing a lot of people forget about when it comes to routing is DNS. DNS is the backbone of the backbone. You can be smart with telling your devices how to get there, but the thing that tries to get there is not going to use the IP, hopefully. It's going to use a DNS name. And especially if you have developers, they're spinning up stuff all the time and, and they have a storage account. They want to connect that storage account to Azure Data Factory and they want to do some stuff in Synapse or whatever. All those things are going to come across and be presented to them as this, this .database.windows.net or privatelink.core.blob.blah, blah, blah, blah. blah. All that stuff is going to be there. Where is it going to route to? It's going to go bypass all that stuff that you did. It's going to bypass all the routing and the network appliances. And from that on-prem location, it's going to go straight to the internet and go to that device, which is not what you want. That's the default stance. Everything is you know, publicly with the FQDN, uh, fully qualified domain name. So we use private DNS zones. And the whole reason why we do that is because it allows us to insert that thing, that service, that platform into our network, give it an IP address that we know about, that we've shared with our routers and then switches and all that stuff. And we have a conditional forwarder on-prem or in Azure or wherever um, that says, oh, you wanna go to the private link address. Anytime you wanna go to database.windows.net, go here, go to this DNS forwarder and it will give you the right IP address. And so that gets in the, in, in the middle and makes sure that whoever's requesting what A gets the right IP address and also ensures that when a new thing is added, it automatically gets added to DNS. Now, not DNS the way it would be with Active Directory and your know, domain joining these things, that, that would be nice, but it's not doing that. It's adding it to the private DNS so that way when the conditional forwarder says, I don't know about this new you know, Kubernetes cluster, ACI cluster, or whatever it may be, or ACI instance, um, I know that this guy knows, and then he'll give you the right IP address. So that would, this is the linchpin in making sure that the cloud uses the routing that you put in place, just like the internet. Um, and, you know, the goal really here is always shut down public paths. You don't want to use it as much as possible, which again is the, the, the the standard perspective of just about everything you deploy in Azure. Um, and don't hard code IPs. As soon as they do that, that's gonna break because you know in a year, someone's gonna come back and take that into production and they're gonna forget there's a hard coded IP and it's gonna move. So I'm sure we've all seen that one before. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I wanna say is don't do this. Don't be that guy that tries to do this. I was the guy that tried to do this at our old company, Chris. <laughs> and I had a client that said, I wanna to migrate to the cloud. And I heard that you can make a VXLAN, an overlay tunnel directly into Azure. And I was like, no, you, no, you can't. And he, he pointed me to this Azure extended network thing that came out a couple of years ago. It was very quiet. Azure was very, very quiet about it. They didn't make a big deal about it because they knew it was dumb. That's my theory. Um, but it's basically a layer two extension, right? So stick with me on this. I think I got enough time because I think this is a fun story. Um, the whole idea is that you want to be able to do a layer two extension. In a data center, you have some overlay. You know, there's name your overlay. There's a billion of them. But um, 
you can use a GRE tunnel, you can use VXLAN, you can use Geneve, you can use, you know, all these different ways of doing it, e EVPN um, inside of a thing, inside of a thing. But the whole idea behind this is that they say, oh yeah, you can extend your on-prem, you know, subnet, this 192.168 all the way into Azure. You can have them both there at the same time and you can transfer information. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. That, this can't be that easy. And they would make a, more of a big deal of this if they could, because it's like VMware's play, you know, like why use, you know, VMware on cloud. So anyway, I built this once and you have two network appliances. They both have to be 2019 servers, or 2016 servers at least. And the interesting thing about this is what you actually have to do is every IP address that lives inside the other side, you know, in Azure or on-prem, this virtual machine has to have a secondary IP of that IP. So basically you have to manually add every IP. So this guy here would have to be added to this machine. And this guy would have to be added to this machine and every other IP. <laughs> and so basically this just becomes a layer three mobility concept. So this guy ARPs back for everything with the same ARP address. It's not with something different. So then when it gets over here, it gets all screwed up. There's no mappings. Anyway, it, it works until it doesn't work. And I just want to say, if you ever are in this world and, and you're getting into networking, you're going you're gonna to get into this. You're going to find this somewhere. Just like I did, you're going to want to have not change IP address. They have some SAP, they've got some database and they're saying, your clients are saying, I can't change the IP address. It's hard coded. It's been there since, you know, a long time. And, and, uh, and we, you know, we, we want, we, I, I read this or I'm going to figure be a hero, right? You want to be a hero. Chris is a hero and Chris wouldn't do this. Chris, I, wouldn't. I, I, still, I still wouldn't do that. That's a lie. You still wouldn't do it, but yeah, don't be a hero. This is, this is one of those teaching moments where I say, you know, if you're a cloud practitioner and you understand the, the technology and you know, it's just not going to suit. I spent th two and a half months trying to make this work when all they needed to do was change three IP addresses. It was a great exercise for me to learn why it sucked, but at the same time, um, you know, learn from my mistakes and realize that you can, if it seems complicated, unnecessarily so, then it is. It's, it's, you know, it's what it is. And if you are like me and you come from a networking background, you will, you will identify these things and go, um, yeah, I don't know about that. Stick with that. Stick with that feeling. Don't let it go. If you don't, if it doesn't seem to make sense, you know, put it up, put it on Stack Overflow and you'll see plenty of people come back and say, don't do it, man. <laughs> friends don't let friends try layer two extension in Azure. Anyway, so that was my talk. And since today's May the 4th, that's me with a lightsaber. Nice. You got that from uh, Bitmoji? Of course I did. Nice. Very slick. Thanks, Ben. But it's not a red lightsaber. <laughs> well, I'm 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 not evil. I'm good. Eh, you, you use a lot of dark themes. I do, but that means <laughs> I'm <good. laughs> nice. Okay. Well, uh, let's turn our attention to the audience. Okay. Folks, anybody have any questions? Um, I saw that Graham asked about the um, the BGP route server, but I believe that that question was answered. Yeah. Um, basically right after you, right after he asked that question. So I didn't, I didn't it's stop a, you to oh, ask you that. Graham, it, it's actually, it's actually kind of like a route reflector. It's kind of like a route reflector um, because of where it lives inside of Azure. Um, and it, 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 and to your DMVPN, I wish it was like DMVPN because then you can start doing like next top resolution and all that fun stuff. Um, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't do all that. It, it is essentially a route reflector that has had its arms taken off and one of its legs broken. So that doesn't give you much, does it? <laughs> <laughs> I, and I think you have friends. I'm your friend. We're friends now. I uh, found for himself. See, no one wants to come to routing conversation. It wasn't sexy AI or ML, so no one's showing up for it, man. I, I uh, think when I do, I'll just put AI and then I'll call it like automated interfaces or something. 
You know, there, there's there's actually there's actually a, a couple of different reasons why uh, sometimes there's not a whole lot of questions at the end of a session. One, you've put everybody to sleep and they are just they're just done with you. I don't yeah. think that's the case. I think it was the second case where it was very thorough. It was very well explained, and and people just don't have a lot to pick apart. Thanks, David. Routing Thank is not know. security. I made that up. I made that up today. So high five to both of us for recognizing that. That's a good one. Are you, are you scrolling up through the through the? Yeah, through I want to. I want to. I want to see if anyone like, is calling me out. Like now, uh, I I literally call you out on the daily, so I've been refraining from it for for this one time. Uh, yeah. Well, Chris keeps me. Chris, well, you know, what? actually, Chris tries to keep me honest, but when it comes to networking, tries. Oh, well, yeah. No, you're definitely better, way better at networking than I am. Yeah, yeah. You're kind of you're kind of smooth brained. No, you're significantly better at networking than I am. Uh, I, well, that's I, I, all I, I, I give you that. I give you that. Absolutely. You're, you're, you're significantly better at being tall. I'll tell you that much. I, I'm, fa I'm fabulous at it. I, I, I rock you, at being tall. You excel. <laughs> um, this has been fun, man. I, I like this. I want to come up with more fun things to talk about. Well, come up with more fun things and we will talk yeah. about them. That, that's how this goes. This is this is like a chat and we, we drag people in and we make fun of them and then yeah. they make adorable May the 4th icons of themselves. I got to make one now. I got to I got to go find one and make one now. Yeah, you should. I, I, that's all of them. All of them look all of them look angry like that. You look I, I couldn't find a smiley one. I guess no you, happy Jedi. No, no. Jedis aren't happy. Mm, see, oh, they, they got to save the world from the back, the the, the back side of this, <laughs> the back side of the forest, the back, the back side of the forest. <laughs> Excuse me, dark, the back side? dark side got back. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that note, everybody, yeah. thank you very much for uh, you. You squandered another perfectly good hour with V Brown bag. Hooray! It's the it's the click and clack sign off. I love that sign off. I love that one. I, know. I miss the Tappert brothers. I do. All right. Yeah, man. Hey, thanks. Thanks everyone for uh, asking the questions that you did. And um, go clean the clack litter, man. Oh, get pretty litter. By the way, it's made with glass beads. Okay, I'm ending the recording now because this. Goodbye, everybody. Have a have a goodbye. wonderful evening. Goodbye.